Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Muddy Outdoors, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Frigid Forage, Rocket Broadheads, Easton Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Ozonics, Wilderness Athlete, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. On today's episode, we've got quite a wide variety of subjects that we're going to cover. And the first one, uh, we've been on this theme of poor man plots now for a few episodes. I'm going to go down into a valley and show you the spot that we're going to build this year into a poor man plot. We would start the work today, but we got rain rolling in and there's no sense in spraying uh, any kind of chemicals on the grass and the weeds to try to kill them and then have the rains come and wash that off. So that's something that we'll have for you in next week's episode. I'm going to talk about the location, uh, the, the trade-offs here, because this one wouldn't be a really good one for hunting, but it's going to be a really cool spot and one where we can feed a lot of deer, probably keep deer focused inside their sanctuary. That's all valuable stuff too. So we'll talk about sanctuaries, we'll talk about this food plot, we'll talk about the challenges of entry and exit, wind swirling in the valleys, uh, and then next week we'll start tearing this thing apart and you know, sweating, uh, putting it back together again. So uh, there's that, we're gonna hit that first, and then we'll come back with some more stuff afterwards. This farm has really gotten super thick over the years. We did, uh, boy, five or six years worth of timber stand improvement here, where we would take a chunk each year and cut out all of the junk timber. But the problem with that, if you're not really careful, is uh, what you release can be uh, invasive. And we've got spots like that now on this farm where we've got bush honeysuckle coming in. This is one of them. I mean, you can see multiple rows here in bush honeysuckle. And this was open before. And you're gonna see other spots like this on the farm. And it's really hard to manage uh, bush honeysuckle. So if you get, if you're planning a, a timber stand improvement project, really take a hard look at what you're gonna release. Uh, if you can see anything growing on the ground, that's pretty much what's gonna flourish once you open up the canopy. If you don't see anything, you're probably gonna get grass at first, and then you'll sort of run through an evolution after that, but uh, that's what we've seen anyway. The areas that have bush honeysuckle, if you release those, it's just gonna flourish and go everywhere. So be really careful. Uh, I, I wish we could go back and you know, hit some of those spots, because we'd have cleaned up the bush honeysuckle first, and then done the TSI afterwards, and now it's just gonna be a nightmare trying to clean it up. So anyway, we're gonna head down through this maze of, of uh, brush into this valley, and uh, Really, I kind of touched on the topic of, of sanctuaries, and, and once we get down in there, that's really one thing I want to pound on is the value of these and how to designate those spots on your farm, uh, how to manage those so that the deer feel really comfortable there. And one of the ways you do that is to give them something to eat. So that's where we're going. Feels like it's going to be raining here pretty quick, so I better keep this moving. I'm in the bottom down here where I was talking about, and this is the typical starting point for us for a poor man plot. We've got more of a little core area here, maybe, I don't know, a 10th of an acre, and then some outlying areas that we could pull into it by cutting off a few trees here and there, cleaning out some brush. We can turn this into as big as a half an acre, I believe, going up through this little valley. It would be a really, really nice looking food plot, but a tough one to hunt. The only chance you'd have to hunt down here would be out of a redneck blind where you could you know, bottle up your scent and uh, keep your odor from spreading around in this valley. Worst case scenario would be, and it's not a bad case scenario, would be to have this, uh, the core of our sanctuary. I don't hunt any of this. This whole valley, I've never hunted it once. There's probably, I don't know, 50 acres down in here that I've never set foot in during the hunting season since I've owned it. And rather than trying to walk through there, bumping into a bunch of deer going in and out, and then having your scent you know, swirling around down in these valleys, I just leave those as sanctuaries and hunt the fringes up on the valleys or up on the ridges around these areas. That has been my definition of a sanctuary. Uh, let's walk this a little bit more and I'll talk a little bit more about how you can create sanctuaries where you're at, how you can figure out uh, which part of your hunting area to leave and then how to manage that. I'm on the upper end of the plot here of the area that we would probably plant. 
And we talk about poor man plots, but I think this one would be a poor, poor sweaty man plot because it would be a lot of hacking, a lot of chainsaw work and a lot of thorns stuck in the arm and, and uh, dragging off the edge. But this is, this is one that we're gonna do. I've got employees, uh, they've gotta do something. You know, they can't just sit around in the office all day long. So I'm gonna get those guys out here and we're gonna, we're gonna work on this one in the coming week. It's starting to rain now and I'm gonna get my camera gear uh, back indoors. So I'm gonna finish up the rest of this episode uh, talking about the additional topics we're gonna cover and uh, more on this uh, whole subject of sanctuaries uh, back inside where it's dry. We did get rained out, so I'm, I'm back in the house. I want to touch some more on the topic of the sanctuaries and then we'll jump on to the next segment of the episode. People who need sanctuaries the most are the ones who are the most reluctant uh, to, to uh, create them. If you think about it, you know, I've got a pretty good sized property. There's only so many places that I can hunt. You know, if there was more people hunting here, that'd be different, but it's just myself and the family and the occasional guest once in a great while. There's plenty of places on this farm where nobody goes during the hunting season unless they're uh, blood trailing a deer. My need for sanctuaries is gonna be lower than somebody who actually hunts on a smaller piece of property. So the guy that's hunting on a 50 acre or an 80 acre piece, he doesn't wanna create a sanctuary because he wants to have all these stand options. But in reality, uh, he needs them more than the guy who's hunting a larger property. Just because his, his hunting pressure is more focused and more intense on the chunk that he's got, he has to be more careful. And he has to have these places where the deer feel completely comfortable, where nobody ever goes. Uh, hunting pressure pushes the deer around more than almost any other factor that affects their behavior. So just keep that in mind. If you're sick of having the deer leaving your property or not moving during daylight where you hunt, it could just be that you're pressuring too much of the property and you don't have those areas that are set aside for the deer. It can be challenging to figure out which areas to set as sanctuaries, uh, but the way I do it is just to, I choose the ones that are the hardest to hunt. Uh, if I know I'm gonna be bumping deer when I hunt those areas, those become my sanctuaries. So that should be a starting point. If you've got spots that are kind of questionable anyway, might be a good idea to carve those out and just not go into them at all. So now we're gonna talk real quick about how you manage the sanctuaries. And like anything else, if you're trying to keep deer somewhere, you have to give them the things that they're looking for. The food, water, cover, and security. The security comes in the form of not hunting it. Obviously the food and the water and the cover are things that you can manage uh, if you have the ability to, you know, to control those properties. But you, you know, don't be uh, afraid to put a food plot in your sanctuary, even though you know you're not gonna be able to hunt it. You want those deer there. If the deer are on your property, at least there's some hope that they're gonna come out of those areas during daylight and you're gonna get a shot at them. Um, if they're not as attracted here, then it's less likely that they're gonna be there in the first place. So we'll, we'll touch more on this in the future. I think it's a super important topic and one that we've never really covered very well here at Midwest Whitetail. Next, I wanna talk about one of our new sponsors here at Midwest Whitetail. Wilderness Athlete is a product line that's really focused on the active outdoorsman. That's their niche market. That's who they're going after. And I really see the need for this product. I've been using it for, boy, I can't remember when Wilderness Athlete was founded, but I've been using their product since it was first founded, uh, probably a decade ago. And for those people who have been uh, paying attention to the, the show over the years, you probably noticed that I lost weight a couple of years ago. I've become a lot more fit. Uh, I, I found myself in a situation where I, I didn't have the mobility. I couldn't get around like I, I could before. I would get tired easily. My joints were sore. Um, I lost that enthusiasm to work hard, to go the extra mile, to move that one tree stand that was going to make a difference. And I found myself just, you know, little by little becoming, you know, lethargic in my hunting. So I've adopted a workout regimen that's really focused on my specific needs. Uh, a lot of cardiovascular work, some strength and flexibility work, but the ultimate goal is just be fit. Uh, I, I don't need to be big and strong. I just need to be fit and have the endurance that's necessary to be uh, aggressive in the field. And it also makes me uh, a lot uh, more, I don't know, energetic uh, for the rest of my life as well. So anyway, that's my testimony on, on why becoming more healthy and making those changes are important. It, it helps you become a better hunter, a uh, more effective hunter, and, and 
should keep me more effective for longer. Uh, I don't want to be sitting here 10 years from now, you know, not even be able to hunt. I want to stretch this out for as long as I possibly can. Uh, a healthy lifestyle is a, is a value in everything that you do. So finding those nutritional supplements uh, that support that lifestyle is important. And that's where Wilderness, Wilderness Athlete comes in. Uh, I've been using their hydration products, which they do a really nice job because you don't have that um, sugar high and then that crash. They've got more of the complex carbohydrates that give you energy without the crash. And uh, you know, staying hydrated, of course, is important to begin with. Uh, the other products I've been using consistently are the meal replacement shakes. I don't eat every single meal like I should. And when I jump over lunch, uh, I just have a, a shake and it gives me what I need to stay fueled and keep my metabolism up and, and you know, keep me going that, that day until the next meal. Uh, I take the joint advantage uh, pills. These are, uh, you know, as you get older, it becomes more and more important because your joints start to get sore. Like I said, I mean, your hinges just aren't as oily as they used to be. Um, so that has been, that's helped a lot with just overall mobility and, and uh, reducing pain in the joints. Uh, I take multivitamins, of course, and uh, I believe that's the, the bulk of, of the product line that I consume. There's also a fair number of products in there that are focused more on the, the bodybuilder or the, the more hardcore fitness advocate, maybe somebody who's a serious mountain hunter and they're trying to strengthen up specific muscles to the maximum that they possibly can. You know, the protein supplements, the nighttime optimizer, some of the pre-workout uh, um, supplements are, are probably gonna be a lot more important for that group. For me, I just focus on the general health and general nutrition. So that's Wilderness Athlete. Please take a, a second and check out their website. Uh, there's a lot of science that goes into this. And, and these guys, they aren't fly by night. They've really done their research and they've got a great staff of people that understand what people need to perform at their best. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Uh, I'm gonna be back here again next week and I'm sure there'll be you know, a lot more blood and scar uh, apparent uh, in the video because we're gonna be in there working on that four-man plot and everything down there had thorns. And uh, I'm not excited about that. But like I said, I've got employees, so maybe I can make the best of this yet. We're also gonna keep uh, visiting products from our sponsors. Uh, we really feel good about the companies that we work with. And, you know, we feel like it's a service for us to show you which products we believe in. So we'll keep, uh, nailing that stuff each episode for a little while too. So thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.